Hi there, welcome to the Raising Cinephiles podcast, a show about passing on your love of cinema to the next generation. I'm your host, Jessica Cantor, and I have worked in all facets of the entertainment industry for the last 20 years and recently became a mom. This week, our guest is Jamie Mayer. Jamie writes and directs for film, TV, and now video games. She's found herself challenged to get her tween son into cinema, even though he likes to make movies of his own. Always remember that myself and guests are speaking from personal experience, not giving parenting advice. Let's go ahead and dive into the episode. Hello and welcome back to the Raising Cinephiles podcast. This is your host, Jessica Cantor, and I am here with Jamie Mayer. She is a writer and director and published young adult novelist. She's currently on the writing staff of Insomniac Games, but has a long history of writing for film and television leading up to this point. And I am so excited to have you here, Jamie. Thank you for joining. Thank you so much for having me. Well, jump into my first question, which is what is your first movie memory? I remember I must have been five or so, four or five, I guess. And I remember watching, as they did every year, The Wizard of Oz was on TV. And we had this room in our house that was like glassed in, like a summer kind of room or whatever that was glass on three sides. And there was a TV in there. And it was night and it was thunderstorming. I mean, it was probably 6 p.m. or something, but it was thunderstorming outside. And I was in there and I was so determined to see the story through because I was so enmeshed in the story that I couldn't leave the room, but I was terrified because of the thunder and because of the flying (laughs) monkeys and all the craziness. And I I don't know if it was the first time I had seen it. Probably was the first time I had seen the movie. I was by myself. And I, so I was stuck in the room with the wizard of Oz and I couldn't leave. And it (laughs) was a little bit scary. Yeah. I can understand why you'd remember that experience really jumping out at you. Movies, when they're real experiences, I think, stick with you. That room you're in sounds very cinematic, but what were the rituals in your family around going to the cinema, renting, watching on television? What was that for you? We would go, I remember going as a family to movies quite a lot. I had a younger brother, three years younger, and so we would go, the four of us, to the movies a fair amount. And I remember seeing also things that, I don't know, maybe it was just the times, but it were adult-ish movies, especially maybe for my brother who was younger. But my parents both loved movies. My mom grew up loving musicals and would always show me Oklahoma and West Side Story and all the sort of classic musicals that mm-hmm. she grew up with and she exposed me to. And then my dad also loved movies. He loved comedies. He would show me the Marx Brothers and things like that, that I had no interest in as a kid, really. And I uh, admire and respect now, but at the time, not so much. But they both were film lovers. And we did definitely go as a family. Yeah, for sure. Where did you grow up? In central New Jersey, sort of Princeton area. That's where I was born. Oh, really? (laughs) That's awesome. In Princeton? In Princeton. Yeah, Princeton Hospital. Oh, amazing. But yeah, and I know mean, Princeton had a charming, if I remember, a movie theater. I didn't live there for very long, but I visited when I was older. But they had one charming old school movie theater, right? Yes, in the middle of town. But then mm-hmm. also because the university's there, there would be a lot of art films and things on campus that you could seek out and that kind of thing. And also just my parents, I was born in New York City and my parents were both lived in New York City for a long time. And as adults went to the theater and we would, Princeton was only an hour from the city, we would go in and see things. So That was very much a part of our exposure to the arts and to theater and movies, for sure. And when did you know you wanted to work in this industry? Not until college. I was always a huge movie fan. I saw everything. But I didn't realize until I got to college, I thought I was going to be a large animal veterinarian, honestly. That's what I thought I was going to do. And I went to college and I was like, you could jump into organic chemistry or you could take this really cool photography course that it seems really appealing. And I was like, I'll take the photography and I'll do the chemistry later. And I just kept doing that until really I amassed a major in visual arts. I was super into photography, still photography, and which I had always loved. And in high school, I had developed my own pictures and had darkroom and stuff like that. I've always been into. And then doing documentary film, because as an undergrad, they didn't do a lot of narrative film or writing for film. So it was really the craft of filmmaking, editing, documentary, 
but also the visual side doing doing photography as well. And so it all started to coalesce. Like I had always liked writing and I had always liked films, but I didn't really put it together until college. Yeah, I didn't either. I was a late bloomer in the world of wanting to be in entertainment. And then all of a sudden I got obsessed and read every book and just Uh wanted to do it. And could you talk about how you developed your taste? Yeah, when I think about the films that really grabbed me in my life. It started in, this will date me, but in the 80s, because it was such a good era. Those were the movies I was watching growing up. And they were, it was such a good era for writer directors, the Spike Lees, the Soderberghs, the Coen brothers of it. Those movies were so important to me at the time. And I, it, not, oh, I want to be a filmmaker and I want to be them, but it, it just, they just grabbed me so hard. I watched Blood Simple so many times. I mean, it was also that you, it wasn't so easy to access things streaming or whatever. And you, maybe you had a VHS of it, right? And you, or you, HBO would play it all the time. So I'd watch things over and over. Blood Simple, she's got to have it. Sex Lies and Videotape. Dead Ringers was a huge one for me for some reason. So I, those movies just really, the sensibility, I think, of that time really got its hooks in me, for sure. When you were watching, as you became a teenager, had a little bit of independence from your family, did you, what was, did you watch movies with friends? Did you go to the theater alone? What was that like for you? Oh, yeah. There was that typical sort of teenage, let's go to the mall and watch a movie and get some lunch and hang out all afternoon. And your parents don't just pick you up six hours later. (laughs) So there was a lot of that incorporated into how you socialize with people and you would go to movies and stuff. But also, yeah, the era of VHS and watching stuff, it was still a little bit new. That was like, we were super into watching movies and watching movies over and over with friends, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Were there ever any movies that your parents didn't want you to see that you (laughs) snuck and saw anyway with your friends? I have a very funny <laughs> memory of being the very first time that Jaws was on TV that I remember. I might have been on before that, but the first time I remember it being on TV and I really wanted to watch it. I was probably I know, 10 or something. And my parents were like, no, it's too scary. And it's probably school night. And no. And I just, I rem- just could not. I was passionate about seeing this movie. I didn't, I don't even know why I wanted to see it. I just wanted to see it so badly. And I remember it was this huge argument with my parents. And of course they were like the reasonable ones and like it was a school night or whatever. I don't know. I was obsessed with seeing Jaws. And part of it was Peter Benchley, who wrote the book of Jaws, lived in Princeton. So I guess I had him in my mind as some, I don't know why I got obsessed with seeing it. I never saw it. I wasn't allowed to watch it. And I saw it years later. It's still one of my favorite movies. I love it. It comes up a lot, both yeah. like from the parents saying it's a perfect movie. There are so many mm-hmm. things about it that hits on every level. And then kids get obsessed with wanting to see it. It's this my idea. My kid does not want to see it. Okay. He is like terrified of scary movies. It does not want to see anything scary. Will not see Jaws. And I don't want to push it because like it'll just compound the problem. But. Yeah. I mean, it's funny because I've also been hearing kids either have a predisposition to enjoy being scared and other kids just, nope, Mm -hmm. they don't want it at all. Yeah. I think it would be really interesting if somebody has studied that, if that's like an innate thing or if it's a, I think I scared my kid accidentally at the movies early on. And that might have influenced his like interest in ever being scared at the movies. I don't know. Yeah. It also may be, like the ability to suspend disbelief versus a stronger sense of logic. Cause when Mm -hmm. I'm speaking to parents, they, or a guest on the podcast will say they understood that it wasn't real. Mm -hmm. Whereas other kids just can't separate what's happening from themselves. And so Mm -hmm. it makes it much scarier Mm -hmm. for them. They internalize what's happening on screen. And so I think it may be a little bit of that also of, just different makeup of sensitivity. Yeah. Yeah. When you start to think about movies in relation to your child, when they're so young, you do realize like there is no story without conflict and there is, and conflict is scary inherently Mm -hmm. to little kids. And so that's a weird dilemma for showing them movies. I mean, it's, you know, that so many people have been terrified by Disney witches and dragons and things like it's just 
how do you tell a story without a little yeah. bit of, of that? I mean, I think the first movie we showed him, we took him to the theater, which was successful, was like Lady and the Tramp. So that was pretty benign. Yeah. Um, then, and how old uh, is he now? He is 13. Okay. So he's hitting the teen years hard. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Just turned. And <laughs> teens start before the teens, for sure. We've been yeah. here for a little while. And so what were you going to say after the success of Lady and the Tramp? Yes. So then I think the next thing we saw was Shaun the Sheep, which was that animated Bardman, mm -hmm. which we thought, oh, great. It's adorable talking sheep and it'll be great. Or not, they don't talk. The, sorry, it was Wallace and Gromit they talk. And it was a complete disaster. It was terrifying to him because I think it was like somebody was stealing the sheep I can't remember, but there was peril, right? There was something mm -hmm. dangerous for the sheep and it freaked him completely out. And he just climbed on my lap and he's mommy too much, too much. Aww. And he made me take him out. I mean, it was really clearly, obviously just too much. And so it was just a miscalculation or we didn't anticipate that. And it really was a little bit traumatic for him. And then he was probably four. And then we compounded that with the next one was Inside Out, which is not great for a five-year-old. So much peril, right? The world yeah. starts collapsing and all that stuff in the last third. And he, like, he just couldn't handle it. I still haven't seen the end of that movie. Yeah, I watched that recently. And it's such a, it's a really fun film actually to watch while you're raising a toddler mm -hmm. <laughs> from a parent's mm -hmm. perspective. Yeah. Of what are all these emotions that are happening and enjoying core memories and thinking about that emotional yeah. state inside. Everybody. It's wonderful. It's a wonderful movie. It just was not for him. No, it's, I could see that. And it like, did you take a break from the movies after that or did you keep trying? We did take a break. I can't remember for how long or what we next went back to, but yeah, we took a break. And there were movies he loved and was obsessed with at home. Sure. He had a period where he was obsessed with Peter Pan and was really, partly because he just really wanted to fly. Like he mm -hmm. like literally wanted to fly. And so he was would watch that movie for clues. How do you fly? What's the deal? How does it work? <laughs> Things like that. And some of the classic Disney and Pixar stuff, of course. But even, I don't know, Finding Nemo was like too scary for a long time. Um, yeah, at home and at the theater? Even at home. Yeah, yeah. even at home, that one was a little yeah. scary. Anything where you get eaten or. <laughs> yeah. They also, like, I had put that one on recently to rewatch, and it, the music really swells in the dangerous areas. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So definitely think sensory wise could be overwhelming. Yes. Yeah, I think that's why we stuck to home for a while after that, because it is so loud. You don't realize as an adult, it doesn't really register how loud and overwhelming that is. I had a guest on who said going to the theater, like sometimes it's good to go late because the credits are so jarring for a young child. Mm. They're fast and loud. And mm -hmm. then you get into the slower paced story, but the screen is big. It's like, it's, it is a yeah. lot. Your son chose the right words. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they did have, this was before the pandemic, obviously, when he was so little, they, there were theaters that were having like mom screenings, like mm -hmm. matinees where the lights were half on and it was okay if your kid was walking around and it wasn't going to bother people. And it was great. Some of those when he was super little, I did take him to, but I don't know if they still do that, but that's a, that was like a wonderful thing. Yeah. I, I don't think my son has the makeup for that. Mm -hmm. Like, he is the run around and want to talk to everybody. If somebody, yeah. if a big kid is running, I want to run with them. Yeah. Type of. I think it was a little more for like moms who needed a movie Jones and like their kids are super little. So mm -hmm. it almost didn't matter what the movie was. It was just like the moms could see a movie. You could nurse your kid. They could toddle around. Yeah. And yeah, it was a little more yeah. like little kid. Yeah. I missed that six month window before he started moving and right. assert, <laughs> asserting his own will on me. You know? Yeah. Yeah. And your, did your son get to know your work in the film world as he was growing no. up? No, he has had no interest in anything I was doing. And, and to be fair, it wasn't stuff I was doing was not kid stuff. Mm -hmm. I had no interest until I started working in video games because that was right up his alley. And so once I started doing that, it was like suddenly I was cool to him and that was like interesting to him. Yeah. Um, and did you play video games before you started writing? For them? I played them growing up. We had 
me and my brother would play after school and stuff like that. And then I didn't play during that whole college and in my 20s. I didn't really play much. And it wasn't until my son started playing that I got refamiliarized myself with that world and started playing stuff with him a little bit just to know what was going on in that world and how are they telling stories and everything. Mm-hmm. So it was interesting. And obviously that you know so much better and fancier than it was when we were little. And big story worlds. I'm curious for your son when he's playing video games, is he really involved and engrossed in those story worlds? I think he is. Yeah. I mean, he it seems like in games because being a game writer is a funny hybrid of our story team at the company that I work for is like a lot of intense movie fans, right? They're movie people, but they also have this in, like deep library of games in their heads as well. And I'm more on the film side of things. And some people have kind of both worlds in their heads. Mm-hmm. And some people are more on the game side of things. So I think my kid is in the middle where he cares about the story and he cares about the gameplay part of it. Some people are really heavy on one. Like some people will play all the gameplay stuff and skip some story. And some people are like really into the story and kind of skip some gameplay. And I yeah. think he's really both. That's interesting. And does he watch the movies related to the games he plays? Yeah. Yeah. He definitely, I mean, things he's, that are appropriate. Like he really wants to watch. He's seen some of the Batman movies, but he hasn't seen all of the Batman movies. Some of the ones that are maybe a little more intense, he hasn't seen yet, but he wants to. Marvel movies obviously are a humongous thing at his age. That's like a giant chunk of what movies are right now. And he has seen tons of those movies. I wouldn't say all of them, but a lot. And and the games I'm working on, Marvel-derived stories. So I've taken a deep dive into that world as well. And it's interesting because I definitely do think about his perspective on what he likes and what he likes to play and what he likes to watch and stuff. I think that all feeds into work stuff. Yeah. I'm really seeing it through his eyes. And he's definitely your target, right? <laughs> like He is the age that kids really get engrossed in the gaming world. Sure. It's, I mean, it's so interesting to, try to get him to watch a movie sometimes and he would much rather watch play a video game he would much rather watch something on youtube than watch a movie a lot of the time and that's a really i mean i'm sure this happens whether it's about movies or something else with everybody where your kid is i'm not you like Mm -hmm. i am not gonna love everything you love and that you have to make peace with that and i remember saying stuff like that to my parents as well within a different context i'm not you right if you love it if you love the marx brothers it doesn't mean i'm gonna love the marx brothers but yeah Does he watch episodic television? Some, but I wouldn't say a ton. There are exceptions, yeah. Or we'll pull him in for something we think he'll like. But like in terms of this ongoing viewing experience of watching things over a long stretch of time, not that much. Not that much. And I mean, you said you'll pull him into things that you think he'll like. Do you have a, I mean, clearly you have a sense of his taste, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Although he does surprise me. Sometimes he'll like things I think he wouldn't and vice versa. So that is part of the fun of experimenting, I mm-hmm. think, a little with him and be like, try this, try that. And I am surprised a lot of the times. Like I showed him Paper Moon, which I thought, because he's done some acting, which is a whole side thing, which I thought you'll appreciate this really amazing kind of performance by a child actor. He loved it. He loved it, even though it was black and white, which Mm -hmm. he normally makes fun of as so ancient, right? And he super loved it. I mean, it is a a really charming movie and it's like, I'm not surprised, but like that surprised me that he was Mm -hmm. so into it. And he really loved West Side Story, the recent one, the Spielberg one. And that surprised me as well. Wouldn't have predicted. But then then things I think are a home run, like, no. Like what? Like we just watched All of Me. You remember that, the body switching Steve Martin, yes. Lily Tomlin. Okay. I thought, okay, physical comedy. It's very silly. I thought he would dig it. Right. Nope. Didn't nope. like it. Bored. Probably, I wonder if he would like twins. I don't know. I haven't tried that one. <laughs> yeah. Funny in the same way. Yeah. I personally am a little obsessed with body switching as a thing, as a story. So like any, anywhere I can find it, I will watch a body switching movie. So I'll have to yeah. try that. And big, did you try big with him? I think we did. Yeah. I think he liked it. It wasn't like, oh my God, the best movie he's ever seen, but I think he liked it. Yeah. We saw that two years ago. Yeah. And I mean, 
Is it just a matter of like hit, hitting his taste? Like he just has really specific taste to want to see a movie or is it just the medium itself? Do you I think, think it's the medium itself. It's like getting him to sit for an hour and a half or two hours is hard. The tension spans are different now. Mine is for sure. Like I'll get up in the middle of a movie or check my email. I know I shouldn't, but I do. You know what I mean? That kind of thing where I wouldn't have done that. Yeah. Before. And going to the theater is so different than watching at home. Yeah. And COVID really affected that, of course. People mm -hmm. just didn't go for a long time. And we did start going back recently. We, My very favorite movie theater has not reopened yet, which is the Arclight in Hollywood. Mm -hmm. And that super bums me out. But we've been going to Alamo Draft House, which is mm -hmm. super fun and makes it more of an experience. And I think is they have pizza, right? So you could get him to go to that in a heartbeat, lure him with pizza. And that's pretty fun. So we've and been going... What do him and his friends do outside of the house? They play video games and they make movies, weirdly. But the movies that they make are not start to finish some very elaborate story. It's like a lot of action sequences, right? <laughs> Strung together. Yeah. It, lightsabers and like yeah. action sequences. But I guess it's a movie, right? Yeah. Play and film basically. Mm -hmm. And do they like really play with how they capture or are they just filming themselves? Some of each. Sometimes it's a little more thoughtful and sometimes it's just make sure you get this cool sword thing I'm doing. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. And do they like, are there places for kids his age to hang out outside of homes? I think that's something that we talk about a lot because living in the city and also living where his friends are a car ride away and it's not easy for him to just walk to a friend's house. It's There's not that that we had more as kids where you can go hang at your friend's house, walk, to, walk after school or go to the mall or whatever. Like they don't really do that. It's really at somebody's house. So it's a little more parent involved, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's, I mean, like I know when I was that age, before getting dropped off at a movie theater and meeting my friends or my brother was in a band. So there was like random places he would play at the local record shop. And mm -hmm. there was places. And when I was in high school in New York, we would hang out in the park together. And, but a lot of it centered around going to movie theaters and stuff. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so now that kids don't really do that, I'm like, what do they do? <laughs> They're dying. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. I think it's not ideal, right? the way that it's so siloed, right? Mm -hmm. This way, they don't, you know, maybe as they get older or, I think about that so much because we, people say this a lot, but you know, we used to wander around and nobody knew where we were. There was no phones. So mm -hmm. it was just like, be home by dinner. And we were in the woods somewhere. Yeah. yeah. I had to have to in. make, yeah, you have to make decisions. I think when that's you, like when you're a kid and you're wandering around the neighborhood or whatever, like you have to figure out how do you cross the street? How do you, I mean, how do you, navigate weird things that happen or come up or whatever. I mean, I don't know if they don't make those decisions on their own. Is that bad? Yeah. yeah it's curious. I know I'm in the Palisades in LA mm -hmm. and Friday night, if I go to CVS, <laughs> there are like, there are signs in the CVS saying, do not come in groups of 15, like three <laughs> students at a time or whatever, right. which I think is hysterical, but they will be like, skateboarding in the parking lot and mm -hmm. hanging out. I'm so excited to see them hanging out. And mm -hmm. there's a little theater that's owned by Netflix in the village, which is walking distance. And it's like such a missed opportunity mm -hmm. to not program for these kids who have yeah. nowhere to go really. Yeah. But do they want to go to the movies? Do they want to go or do they want to look do other if there things? was content for them? I think mm. they would. I mm -hmm. just, I don't think we're making content for them. Maybe. And it's priced out too. It yeah, that's true. I don't know. Yeah, it was a lot easier to just do nothing then also. I mean, that's a whole different conversation maybe about how kids are overscheduled or they have things that they have to do after school. There wasn't as much just hanging around, it seems like, time. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's interesting. I think about the future of movie theaters as I speak to people on the podcast that we're growing up in the 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s growing up and how movies for all of us was a social activity, was a thing we mm -hmm. did, was a mm -hmm. thing that connected us to other people in the country, created mm -hmm. 
a unified conversation because there was day and date releases happening. Yeah. And now it, it feels like that tradition wasn't passed down. And so it's understandable that Arclight is closed. Yeah. I don't know. I have to believe that storytelling will endure and it will be back maybe in a different way. Uh, it will have a resurgence. I don't know. I do think the older I get, the more I really, it used to be like, I, I really want to make movies. And like, in my mind, I was like justifying, why is that socially like important? And maybe I just want to make movies and I'm not curing cancer. But the older I get, the more convinced I really genuinely am that storytelling is so intrinsic and important to us in terms of how we make sense of the world and how we make the world meaningful. Yeah. And also how we build empathy because we see other places and other people and other lives that are so different than ours. I saw so many foreign films growing up that were like parts of the world I have still never been, right? Mm -hmm. But like you get that glimpse. I think it's so important. I definitely think movies are going to stay. I just, I think the way we see them is changing. Mm -hmm. And I think that also affects the film itself. I think how it lands, Mm -hmm. sitting in a room with strangers is a, end with your peers is a really different feeling than being with just a friend or your family at home watching something. For sure. Especially comedy, I think is really affected by that. Mm -hmm. But everything is, yeah, it feels different. It hits differently, right? When it's Yeah. And seeing a movie that maybe has some emotional or physical things that make you uncomfortable around your parents or even in your parents' home that you could experience in a theater well, another thing that comes up a lot on the podcast, and I love to talk to you about it, is utilizing kind of cinema and television to have conversations with the kids about what life is about to bring them, like conversations mm-hmm. about drugs and sex and kind of all of the things that start to yeah. happen in high school. Yeah. I don't know. We're just approaching that. My kid is still at the point where if somebody kisses on screen, he goes, ew, and he runs out of the room. I mean, he's just totally not into it. But yeah, I don't know. It definitely did not function that way for me and my parents. It definitely did not. It was like, and that's me maybe, or maybe that's them. I don't know. There were certainly things we saw that were like bizarre to see with my parents. I remember one time, this was at home, my mom rented Betty Blue. I don't know if you remember this movie. It's a French movie from the eighties. And it opens with this extremely like explicit sex scene, just right off the bat. And I'm sitting there with next to my mom. It's just the two of us watching at home. And we're both trying to be like, okay, we're cool with this. I was probably in high school and we're like, okay, I'm like cool with this. And like my mom, I'm not going to say anything. And it just keeps going and going. And then finally, <laughs> my, like we just couldn't date it. Finally, my mom goes, it is French. And we were just both like mortified by the way. Yeah. Bit. But it wasn't like a conversation starter. No. no. You know, I, I talked to my mom about it a lot. I'm like, did you ever contextualize what we were seeing together? Like one of the movies we watched together a lot was Beaches. Mm-hmm. Cry. And it's pretty heavy, that movie. Mm-hmm. And she was like, no, no, I don't know. I probably needed somebody to contextualize it for me. She was a young mom. But I think the parents were more media savvy than our parents were and Mm -hmm. we grew up with media in a different way with understanding that media has an affect on the brain Mm -hmm. and someone's modalities and kind of all of those things and so the way we approach it with our children is more mindful than our parents yeah and there were definitely things like i that i loved and that my parents clearly did not love and that was always like It was whether they like hated the music you were listening to or hated this movie you loved or whatever. It was like a personal affront. It was like painful. I try to remember that when my kid wants to listen to some horrible music or something that I think is terrible. And I truly try not to yuck his yum Mm -hmm. or be dismissive of it because I remember that was like super painful because when you really love something, music or film or, or whatever, I used to love Mad Magazine when I was growing up and I would be like, this is so funny, mom, you need to read this. And she's like, it's just not for me. It's just not my thing. And I was like, what? How could it not be? Yeah. It's hilarious. You know what I mean? <laughs> but it was like, it hurts when your parents don't recognize the thing that lights you up or whatever. Yeah. Or even just dismiss it. Dismiss. You're discovering parts of yourself at that age. Yeah. You're, dis- you're discovering your humor and your empathy and your own taste. It's definitely something I need to be mindful of. 
So if you were to approach like introducing your son to cinema, would you go about it in a different way? You mean instead of the, what we did? Yeah. I mean, this- <laughs> maybe, I don't know. You got to start somewhere. I just, I don't know what is less scary than Sean the Sheep. I, I, I don't know that I could have anticipated that or done it that much differently. I'd maybe just wait till he's older to go to the mm-hmm. actual theater. Ah, yeah. I don't know. Or he's just not that kid or something. I don't know. Yeah. Or he'll evolve as he gets older. I mean, we just, I keep, I keep trying like different vibes with him. And we mm-hmm. recently watched Harold and Maude, which is, I love so very much. It's so seventies that it's so of itself and it's quirky. performances are amazing and quirky. <laughs> and I thought, oh, maybe that'll grab him somehow. It's unusual. And I don't know, attention getting and it's mm-hmm. oddness. And he did like it. He did, but he was like, so bummed out. I don't want to I don't want to spoil a like 40 year old movie, but he was so bummed out by the character that dies in the end. I just ruined it. By the ending. He He was so bummed out. By by the ending. And, and I was like, but isn't that kind of the, I don't know. It's not the same movie. If that doesn't happen, how could it end differently in some way? It's inevitable. It's like the only thing that could happen. And it just, I don't know. He didn't like, he doesn't like unhappy endings. He doesn't like things that don't turn out. And did he give you any more insight into what, like why that doesn't speak to him or he just. I think having come through the last whatever years of COVID and of our political environment in our country, I do think that things that are like a reality bummer are just not as intriguing. I really liked dark movies and dark stories growing up. And I mean, that's, probably says more about me, but serial killers and things. I mean, when I was older, not when I was really little, but like dark stories and stuff were intriguing to me. And I do like horror, smart horror. I like, and he, I think, I don't know, maybe he'll evolve, but he does not at all have any interest in stuff like that at all. And I do think it's because the environment he grew up in was like a little more extreme, right? Than when we were kids, there was no big, it didn't enter our consciousness. I think the way that kids now, yeah, what they've gone through. I'd be curious if, he would be a fan of the Jim Carrey suite of Ace Ventura and Dumb and Dumber and or Jack Black stuff. Yeah, he did like School of Rock. That Mm. was really super fun. Yeah, we should go further there. Maybe I think there's fun to be had with sort of broad comedy. Yeah, some of it's light. I definitely think they're geared towards a teenage boy. Mm -hmm. And, And when I'm speaking with other families like that escapism, that that gives you it's uplifting in a way and funny and you can get lost and lost in it they don't have that bummer even in the sad the scary scenes aren't really bummers yeah i was just thinking um recently men in black i was thinking he might dig because he's really into right now he's like really actually is into like james bond and spy movie kind Mm -hmm. of tropes and stuff that's the kind of thing he's been making with his friends and he wanted to watch a bunch of older James Bond movies. So we've been dipping into those, even though a lot of them are very terrible, the old ones, <laughs> in my opinion. <laughs> They're just like corny or weird and sexist or just yeah. absurdly outlandish plots. But he kind of is liking those right now. I don't know. Maybe that's... Yeah, maybe the Ocean series too. Yeah, we did watch the first one. Yeah, we watched the first one, which he liked. But yeah, there's more heist, I think more heist stuff. More heist stuff. stuff. Like yeah. Knives Out could be interesting too. And the Agatha Christie type stuff. I bet you he'd like Hitchcock. Maybe. It, it's of the same vibe, some of those. Yeah. It's a little slower moving and it might be harder to get him uh, into it. But yeah, well, that's a good direction, I think. Well, it sounds like he is finding his way into cinema. It's just a matter of finding his thing. Maybe. Yeah. Maybe yeah. it is. And it's just maybe so separate from your thing. That yeah. <laughs> that's my yeah. problem. It's not his. But it's cool that he's making movies with his friends. And that's that's what's pushing him into wanting to explore different types of stories. And mm-hmm. Is he a big reader? He is a pretty big reader. Yeah. Yeah. Because I do think, you know, I know this is a podcast about cinephiles. I think... It is also really about story and Mm -hmm. being engrossed in story and different kinds of stories. And they're so intrinsically connected to Mm -hmm. literature and all different kinds of medium of storytelling. Yeah. No, when I first caught him 
with his light on after bedtime and he was sneaking a book. I was like secretly, yes. Bedtime, two more <laughs> chapters, please. <laughs> I was like, turn your light off and then secretly like celebrating. Yeah, it's so hard when my I'm doing bedtime routine and obviously this is a much younger version, but my son wants another book. Mm-hmm. I'm like, I'm not going to say no. Until you realize he's like playing you 10 books. <laughs> yeah, he's not quite there yet. He actually, I think, genuinely wants the next book. But that'll happen soon enough. Just <laughs> yeah. more, more. Yes. Yeah, so I'm I'm going to ask a question, which is, what movie do you think I should show my son to have him love movies? And it doesn't have to be his first movie. It could just be any movie that would have him fall in love with cinema. I don't know because I haven't succeeded at that perfect movie yet. I thought I had a really good one. And it is my best suggestion, I guess, to you. But maybe wait until we did this last year. He was 12. Maybe wait until later. But I was, because I really was, like, I was trying to do exactly what you're saying. Where, what is that movie that will spark something? And I was like, Amelie. I was like, this will be delightful. It's visual. It's whimsical. She's adorable. Like, it's Paris. How adorable. He'll mm-hmm. love it. It's quirky and fun. So we watch it. And I was like, what did you think? And he's, that lady's weird. <laughs> and so I failed at that, but maybe he just was a little young think of a better movie somehow than that for like what movies are amazing at yeah maybe it's just like a trip to paris (laughs) is what's needed and then connecting the world of the film to the world yeah i did he did say he wanted to go to paris not long after that so i think in that way it did succeed so maybe that's he got another culture it's interesting, I, and I wonder if maybe he just didn't find a character for himself in it. That could be true, yeah. It is a more adult story, young adults. Yeah, and it kissing makes him go yuck. Yeah. yeah, so he might not be ready, but maybe the movie is actually, like, one of your least favorite James Bond films. Yes, <laughs> that it could be. It could be, right? It could be anything that sparks it. You never know. Something really that you think is terrible. Yeah, it seems your son has similar taste to Emily Ziff's son uh-huh. or Emily Ziff Griffin's son because he loves spy stuff. And that's why I thought maybe Hitchcock too, because it fell into the like James Bond Hitchcock. Yeah. List. Yeah. I'm going to put that on my list. I have a running list of what about this? What about that? Yeah. <laughs> so I'll keep so trying. Keep I'm going to keep plugging away. Keep me posted if there is like one that is magic. Yeah. <laughs> you know, the Silver Bullet movie. I don't know. If yeah. It exists. Yeah. Thank you so much for joining me today. Yes, thank you. Really a pleasure. If you enjoyed the conversation, please don't forget to like and subscribe. New episodes release every Wednesday. And leave a comment and let me know which movie you think I should show my son. Until next time, take care.